it's just a huge honor for me today to be podcast interviewing Dr. Ira Camp all the way from Ithaca, New York. Correct. Ithaca, New York. He graduated from Emory University School of Dentistry in 1978 in Atlanta, Georgia. Did a GPR in Upstate Medical Center, Syracuse, New York. He's on the Indian Health Service Navajo Indian Reservation right here in Arizona from 1970 to 1980. Private practice, Ithaca, New York, since 1985. Certified acupuncturist, New York State, 1983. Eastman Institute of Oral Health, Rochester, New York, 2006 to present. Clinical instructor, teaches practice management courses. His hobbies are music, basketball, meditation. It is an honor to have you. Now, I had your son on. That's correct. And your son is um, was podcast number 773, Dental IT Support with Ruben Camp. Uh, great kid. Uh, congratulations on having a great kid. Now, how, yeah. how old is Ruben? He's 31. 31. How many kids did you have? Two. Two? What, is the other one in dentistry, too? No, she's a nurse practitioner at Cornell. So she's in healthcare. Yeah. I find it, I know what the red flag in their mind was, is that acupunctures, what's it, they, they don't teach that in dental school. How did you get interested in acupuncture? Well, I was always interested in that, even from when it first started. It came to the United States in 1972. One of Nixon's uh, staff was in, was in China, and he had um, appendicitis and had his appendix removed, and he got acupuncture for his recovery, which went really quick. So when I was in college, I heard that. And then um, when I was in my residency at Upstate Medical Center, there was uh, some, I wasn't involved in it, but I heard about it. There was some uh, research on acupuncture there and giving the naloxone, and it would actually reverse the effects of acupuncture because acupuncture can release endorphins. And then um, in my travels, I, uh, I took a course in homeopathy, and then a person teaching it told me about another dentist in Woodstock, New York, that did acupuncture. And I went to visit him, and he inspired me. And it just happened New York State was offering um, our certification program, and I took it. Now, did that dentist go to Woodstock? Pardon me? Did he go to the concert in Woodstock? Um, I don't know that. You didn't ever ask him that? I never asked him that. They he, say if everyone who says they went to Woodstock actually did, <laughs> there would have been like half the country would have been there. Yeah, I didn't ask him that. I know so. Much. So, um, so a lot of dentists um, are conservative. They hear anything about naturopath or holistic or acupuncture, they just go crazy. And I always operate in the field that when you go back every hundred years back in time, I mean, we just, I mean, we're just leapfrogging up, and so we know what we know, but we don't know what we don't know. I'm sure a thousand years from now, we're going to look like we're in the Flintstones. So I always operate in the mode that we only know probably what, what percent of all knowledge do you think? Homo sapien is aware of right now? Probably about 20%. Okay. So, that, you know, they don't even know what dark energy is, dark matter, you know, they don't. So, so is there, so what's the science behind acupuncture? Well, it is science. Do you think it's real or do you think it's uh, uh, psychosomatic? Well, as I stated before, there was some research done in uh, 1979, I heard about it, that they uh, did research with uh, people and they did found the effects of acupuncture were helpful and then they'd inject them with naloxone which was reverse uh, the endorphin release and they found that the effects of acupuncture would, would be reversed also. So that's one of the first studies I heard. And then acupuncture is something that's licensed in New York State and other states, probably, I guess it's licensed here, there's acupuncturists. And it's, to get a license there has to be some uh, scientific evidence that it does have an effect. So. And, and there's also, you know, looking for niche markets. Like, like I know dentists who, um, you know, all, everybody else is advertising this and that or their hours or what insurance they take. And they said, um, my dental office is off the grid. All of our energy is, is ran by solar power. And he has millennials driving an hour across town because mm -hmm. they just, they really relate to someone. And, and another huge buzzword on websites is... Um, natural, alternative, holistic, and I know the dentists on Dentaltown, they, they just cringe when they hear that kind yeah. of stuff, but my God, the market wants it. Yeah, I use the word integrative. In fact, there's a sign in front of my practice called Integrative Dentistry, and that's what my website is. So it's more about bringing it into what also works. It's not leaving anything out, at least checking things out, what works and what doesn't. Uh, we also do surgery, we do implant surgery, and we do oral appliances for sleep disorder breathing, and we do general dentistry, 
and we have massage therapists that work in our practice. That's probably the one thing I could recommend for people. If you're looking at making something work in your practice that makes a difference, is having people have massage therapy while they're practicing dentistry. And what it does, it does two things. One, it has the patients really be real, uh, comfortable in the chair. It also helps us dentists. The dentistry is a very stressful uh, process for dentists. Not only, we're so close to the patient's face and we're doing this work that potentially hurts. Um, so what it does is that the, that the patients is so comfortable in the chair that they're not, they're, the, they're, there's less expression of, of being nervous or it being maybe painful. And what that does, it reduces the stress on me immensely. Sure. In fact, I tell, I tell my patients that if they, I said that you're doing this for me, not you, because I feel so much more energy left after I practice in a day that the, uh, that the massage therapists are there. So the one thing I would recommend highly is have a massage therapist in your practice. I don't charge the patients for it. We used to uh, charge in the beginning, and they wouldn't pay $25 for massage, but they would pay you know a couple hundred dollars for a restoration, but they wouldn't want to pay $25. So we just uh, just incorporated in there, and it works. So the massage is in the dental chair. Sure, yeah. So well, it's, so they're at the work, patient's so feet. It's what? They're at the patient's oh, feet. Oh, it's only foot massage. Yeah, unless they before and after they'll do other things, or sometimes they'll do their hands and arms, but primarily it's foot massage. And you have a very successful practice. I have yes. I, yeah. and, and, and this guy. Okay, so first of all, here here's his on his website. Um, I Dental Spa. His mission to practice in an environment that offers comfort to our patients, delivering caring therapy and commitment and excellence in the services we provide. We our services. We integrate traditional dental services with sleep therapy, acupuncture, massage therapy, nutritional guidance, and natural remedies. And count in mind, he's got four doctors in there. It's it's. Iris in there, Mavis, how do you pronounce it? Mavis Ng. Ng, yeah. Mavis Ng, mm -hmm. Elizabeth. Rashawn. Rashawn, Gabrielle. Chornay. Chornay. <laughs> All four, that, that, that's your secret to success. Four dentist names you can't, uh, uh, can't yeah, uh, really. pronounce. No and then we got one, two, three, <laughs> four, five, five hygienists, three mm -hmm. massage therapists. I mean, this is, this is hugely working, isn't it? Oh, yeah. Yeah. I could, so, with the, I, I, let me tell you about there's a few things about my practice that are, I think are important. The first thing is um, with my staff. My assistants are specialists, okay? So one, one of my staff, and they, they can assist with general dentistry. All of them are cross-trained, so they can do the front desk. They can assist, and they can clean up, uh, seat the patients. So they're all cross-trained. They're not, they're not just one job they do. I have one of my assistants, Tracy. She does the sleep medicine, uh, oral, oral appliances. So she hands that. Um, uh, we uh, we have a computer program through uh, DS3, and we, she handles all the insurance. DS3. DS3. That's Dental Sleep Solutions. Okay, Dental Sleep Solutions. Yeah, yeah. So uh, she handles all that. She handles the insurance. Can you send me the link to DS3. Uh, she handles all the insurance, um, making sure that... Is that medical or dental? Uh, it's medical insurance, but yeah. we, we computerized it. It has made it a lot simpler. Yeah. I've done oral appliance therapy since uh, the early 2000s, and we've been using this for about a year, and it has made a difference in, in uh, the, finding out how much the insurance is going to cover, which makes it easier for the... Um, for the patients. So she handles that, and I could talk about the whole hour, I could talk about just that and how we run that. I have, a, we have Dr. Chornay, she's actually practices out of Rochester, and she comes down once a month, and she's double trained as a um, oral surgeon and a periodontist. And she comes down, and we have her come in and do implants on our patients. And she is, she is awesome, she's world class. Um, every patient has to get a cone beam. Uh, so she's a board certified oral surgeon and parent. I don't know if she's board certified. She's an oral surgeon and she but got a, oral surgery yeah. residency? Well, she got trained in Romania with oral okay. surgery and she got trained at Eastman Institute of Oral Health for peri perio. So she's a periodontist in the United States. Yeah. An oral surgeon from Romania? Yeah. Can you um, place implants too? I have placed implants. I do mostly mini implants I do for people who can't afford. I'll, 
at a reduced cost, I'll put mini implants in for people, mostly for single crowns. I'll do that. Now, do, do you have, for her implants, do you have like a CBCT? Yeah, she has one in her office. The, our patients have to travel a couple hours, but she makes it so reasonable for them. It's, you know, a few hundred dollars rather than a couple thousand dollars if you stayed in Ithaca. And she uses it and she makes uh, surgical guides out of that. And um, The point, I'm, uh, do, yeah, do you going. mind sharing what, well, you, what you pay? Her, her to do the is I, a percentage? Okay, well, let me tell you what. I, the patients pay about $1,850 for the implant to be placed. Just for the implant? Yeah, and then about $1,800 for the crown, the abutment and the crown. So the whole thing is 3600 Yeah. Do you split that like... No, I, I pay her $700 for every implant she puts in. So you pay $700 for implant, and, and but you charge... We charge about $1,600, $1,650. Now, the idea is that... So you, you pay her seven hundred, but you charge sixteen fifty. Yeah. So what um, percent is that? It's uh, probably about forty five percent. Seven sixty would it be seven sixty? No, seven hundred, right? Yeah. You said seven hundred divided by sixteen fifty mm -hmm. is forty two percent. And the point I try to make in this is that a lot of dentists think, uh, well, I'm going to go learn how to place implants. They'll buy a $100,000 CBCT. They'll fly to Dominican Republic. They'll buy a bunch of inventory. They're usually like, have dug themselves into a hole of like a quarter million dollars before they place an implant. And I wouldn't want an implant on me placed by someone who only placed one implant. Right. Are they placing, the only way you place the implant that gets profitable is if you, or anything profitable in dentistry, you got to do at least one a week. Yes. That's why you're probably on fillings and crowns. You, you mm -hmm. do. But these dentists that do one, one every two weeks, or they do 10 or 15 a year, if they would have had a specialist come in, like you, and pay them 42% of what they do, they'd have had no debt, mm -hmm. and they'd had extra income on their existing assets, so they mm -hmm. increase their return on asset, they increase their return on equity, their balance sheet doesn't get burdened with debt, and that's just the way to do it. Yeah, I've actually, I've had, she's the third surgeon I've had, and teaching at Eastman has given me the opportunity to meet people who have uh, special skills in this area, whether they're oral surgeons or periodontists, and I, I've invited them down. So I've been doing this for about 16, uh, no, about 13 years. I've had, she's the third surgeon. How far are you from Eastman? That's two hours. Two hours. Mm -hmm. So you have people come down from there? Odd people come down, yeah. And a lot of these big implant centers that you see in these big major cities, you don't realize that the people placing all the implants are, um, like they have a big one in Phoenix, there'll be the specialists coming down from Flagstaff or up from Tucson, so they'll go put in these big implant centers, and they'll get surgeons to come from um, some town of 50,000 that's a two-hour drive away that says, I wasn't going to get any of this market anyway, I'll just come in. and. Well, there's an also benefit is that when you have somebody come in and doing the work, and this person's world class, so I would trust her with just about anybody, that um, you also get backup. We get backup, you know, 24-7 if we need it, that she's really there for us, not only for these cases, but we can discuss the cases with her, and we, she's restored them also. When she taught at, at the Eastman Institute, she also did restorations on these crowns. Uh, on the implants and therefore she has a perspective of how, not only putting them in but how to put them in so they're restorable mm -hmm. so what what she does she restore them or do you no have... i do it but she's she's capable of doing does that. she only use one implant system we use stroman stroman which is expensive but it, you know i i want to be give the my patients the best there is so why did, why did you pick the most expensive stroman because that's what she picked. That's what uh, the, the, it's either Astra or Stroman. That's what the surgeon said. And Astra is uh, Densply Serona. Yeah. And Stroman is the largest implant company in the world yeah. because they bought um, what's the number one implant system in Brazil? I don't know. What is it? Neodent. Good job, Ryan. They bought Neodent. They mm -hmm. bought the um, what's the one in Israel? Um, the initial standard IMS. Uh, some implants. I think it's, it's IMS. It stands for something. Uh, what is it? Keep, keep it. Israel. What does MIS stand for? Make, make it simple. MIS. Make yeah, it MIS simple. implant of Israel. Make it simple. So they bought a lot of other regional mm -hmm. players, but, but um, yeah. You, so you kind of you think it's worth the money? I think it's definitely worth the money. Not only do you get the implant, and then you get to restore the crowns or bridges, or dentures, over dentures. 
um, you also get somebody to back you up. Yeah. That you don't have to worry, that person is part of your practice, and therefore uh, any problems that come up is like within your practice. You don't have to worry about going, oh, you got to go to And the system. young kids watching this, they don't realize that when you get out of school at 25 and do 10 veneers on someone, that 10 years later, is any of that going to need rework? Could be. Yeah, and you, so you place an implant out of school, and you saved $100 on the implant because, like, the country of Italy alone has over a hundred different implants. So you found some implant on the internet, and then 10 years later, something goes wrong, and you can't, and the company's non-existence, you can't find the part, and if it did go to court, well, you know what the plan's gonna say, well, show me the research on this implant. Oh, they're out of business, I have no, you know, so. Well, getting back to my assistant, Joyce, I were talking about assistants and, and having them as specialists. Well, her thing is that she runs our implant practice. Now, she's only, uh, Dr. Chorney only comes one day a month, but there's definitely enough work of uh, arranging a patient's appointments and making sure we have the right radiographs. And so uh, some of her t is um, arranging all of that. So she does general dentistry and... Who does, who's this? No, she doesn't do general dentistry. This is Joyce. She's okay. does, she's does general dentistry as an assistant. She doesn't practice dentistry. And then I'm continue with that. I have another dental assistant that loves dental lab work. And now she's being trained to be a dental lab tech. Uh, right now it's just removable, but what I'd recommend for people who can bring somebody into their own practice who loves doing dental lab work, you don't have to send it out. It does you two things. One, it gives you immediate results so that you can get the lab work back without having to worry to mail it or have somebody pick so it up. So you have an assistant doing your dental lab yeah. work? Is she doing a lost wax technique? or? Can uh, we haven't gotten to the removable yet. Or the last lost wax. I mean crowns. Yeah, but lost wax technique may be passe. Most people are doing zirconia now, right? Right, so is she, is she doing... <laughs> no, not now? yet. We're, we're start, this is just kind of a new thing that we've taken on because she has the passion for that. So right now she's doing a more removable, like flippers and uh, Essex, re, Essex uh, retainers or Essex appliances for replacing teeth after surgery. Uh, so that's what we're doing with... But we're slowly building up. She has the skills. And we're going to, she's going to do removable partial, uh, probably not the frameworks because we wouldn't have room for that in our office to have that. <clears throat> but she'll make dentures, you know, wax them up. And it's, um, that's a great thing. Uh, you know, if you're looking for ways to make your practice successful, having your assistant specialize in these things is a great thing. Not only does she do that, but she's a great dental assistant, does, does cross train and does everything. And how long has she been with you? She's been with me. Mm, Ten years. Yeah, yeah. Most and of the my patients pick up on that the most. I mean, uh, employee turnover is about the best way to measure anything. Yeah, we have my, most of my employees have been with me for ten or twenty years. It's hard to grow real value in a service business, uh, or actually any business, with a bunch of employee turnover. Well, it is. So what I'd recommend is giving your employees as much responsibility as you can handle, and also within the legal realm of whatever your state board says is okay, but really give your staff as much responsibility as you can because that makes them grow. I also, so I have another dental assistant that takes kind of care of, uh, care of patient relations to make sure everybody's good and comfortable. So that's her, that's Taya. So I have four dental assistants and each of them has a specialty. But the so all, dental assistant just for you? No, I, we have uh, four dentists that are working yeah. with us, although to, only two of us are full time. But having the, having the assistants take on as much of that as possible. So, so the rumor is that most, well, most animals are controlling because it um, helps with their survival. I mean, you don't want to have a chaotic environment. You'll be eaten by hyenas. So a lot of dentists are very controlling and don't let their staff do anything. What, what advice would you give? Well, if it works, keep doing it. I mean, we don't want to go, th sometimes that works. There's a space for it. Uh, military does it, I guess. So it, there's a space for that. However, in my practice and how my way of being, it wouldn't work any other way. I, I, I wouldn't have time to control everything. And you know, the, the word control is interesting because you know what the opposite of control is? What? Trust. Really? Yeah, so the nice. opposite of control is trust. So that's the thing to develop. Can you trust the people around you? Maybe the people that control so much don't have enough trust in the people around them. What are the basic elements, do you think, in a successful practice? A lot of the people that listen to podcasts, 
um, are young. They just got out of school. They're working in a social somewhere. They, they want to own a practice like you someday. Um, what are the elements of a successful dental practice? Well, some of the things I've gave you are, are part of the workings. I think when I teach residents, um, and they're from all over the world and have different cultures, so what, what that means is that they have um, more to learn about our culture. It's not like you can just speak about what it is like to live, be in our, our culture. Um, so what, there's three C's I call. One is uh, confidence. Confidence? Co and actually, the first one should be competence. Competence. Yeah, you want to make sure you're competent in what you do. Um, the second one is confidence. Have confidence in what you're doing and how you work. And then the third one is communication. So all of those three, if you want a kind of a foundation of how to be in a practice, you have to look at yourself in those terms. That's important. So, so competence, um, that was one of the reasons I started on Dental Town, the online CE. We now have 400 classes. That's why I'm doing the podcast. I noticed over the last 30 years that no matter where that dentist started out of the gate, if they consumed 100 hours of CE a year or more, or mm -hmm. even 200, 300, they, they just, the cream rose right to the top. The more, and so, you know, I'm trying to do the podcast where they, they got an hour commute to work and they get to listen to all these amazing minds like you. Um, they might not be able to go to the Chicago Midwinter meeting next week, but they can take 400 courses online. Um, how do you think, um, what, what do you think leads to competence the most? Is it continued education? What, what I think it? we got to work together. The, the thing is, we're very individual in our society. We don't have training, or, we're not trained to work together. We all have our own boxes, our own office, and we have everybody is on their own in the idea of working together and working together you get into partnership there's a problem it's like marriage they don't work very well yeah and the partner in dentistry is a sexless marriage with no children I know and you don't spend holidays together I've been there and done that <laughs> um, in marriage or partnership both but I'm married to I'm married the second time but yeah. partnership it didn't work uh, and, and you're, and, so your marriage, so you had one divorce, uh -huh. but one fell partnership in dentistry too? Yeah, they were happening at the same time, so that's a whole interesting story. Yeah, well, I mean, the, these dentists just, I mean, they, they don't realize that um, there's a lot of glues that hold marriage together. So, right, so for the young dentist, you need, you're going to have to find somebody to coach you. So, you know, when I take on an associate, the first thing I say, I'm into excellence and I want you to be excellent. And I say, if it takes you an hour or the whole day to do a restoration, do it. And I think we, as experienced people, have to give back to uh, the people that are just graduating rather than being a competition. We have to make it so it works for them because they're gonna take our place, you know? Uh, and hopefully they take our place in the context of excellence. Um, so having excellence as a basis of practice is really important. And I think that for the young dentist, you're, you need to find uh, people who are willing to take this on. So what I'd like to say is that the, our practice is like breathing. We breathe in and we use the oxygen and, and whatever else is in the air that we need and we give it out. And I think our practice should be the same way, our practice in life. That we, we have to learn how to take in, how to take a breath in. And people coming out of school have to learn that, and they're going to have to depend on us to learn how to breathe in in this with, with all the stresses that are there. And then the second thing is how to use it. How do you use the, the information in the best way? How to manage your practice? And then the third thing is giving back. And I think it's important that all of us eventually, if not right away, give back. And it's important for us to give back to the people who are graduating. Take them on. Take them on as a as um, a way to nurture your own lives, it'll make our whole industry better and it'll serve people better if we take on helping other people become great, excellent professionals. You know, um, the, you said a lot of, uh, makes me wonder why you chose dentistry. Wow, what a question. Well, <laughs> um, the, the, my story is, is that I didn't, when I grew up, dentist, as a patient, dentistry sucked. It would hurt. I didn't have any anesthetic. My dentist would threaten me with this black thing that I'm going to cut your tongue off if you don't hold still. And so I didn't grow up with this thing, wow, dentistry, what a great thing. 
And by the time I was 15, my dentist finally gave me some local anesthetic. I said, why didn't you do this before? So anyways, I didn't, I wasn't, uh, it wasn't a friendly atmosphere for me with dentistry. So um, then, you know, my father, George, bless his heart, he's not alive anymore, but he was not really an inspiration for me. And I held an older brother, and I, he wasn't an inspiration for me either. So my, sis, my sister ended up becoming engaged and marrying uh, this fellow, Alan Chernoff, um, who is, um, he was in, he went, applied to dental school. Some of it, the reason why, well, he applied to dental school and got in, and so he was actually a, a male figure that I could look up to. I didn't have anybody else. If he was probably a garbage person, I would have followed him. So he would happen to be in dental school, and I went and visited him at the University of Maryland, and he was making a denture. And I said, wow, what a great idea. Look neat. So I went and applied to dental school. That's what got me in. It's been a hard road. Dentistry is not easy work. It's not easy work. And even from the beginning, you know, I had to learn how to be an artist. I, I was not naturally an artist. I had to learn how to be an artist. And luckily, the school was able to teach me that. And so that's how I got into it. But my passion, as we talked about earlier, before we started, my passion was really about helping people in their lives. So you were born in Ithaca? No, I was born in Syracuse, New York. Syracuse. Went to dental school in Atlanta, Georgia. Uh -huh. My gosh, I would think uh, going from freezing cold northern New York State to Georgia, how, how, was it hard to leave and go back to the frozen? Well, between there, I actually traveled around. I went, well, family is what brought me back. My yeah. parents were still living there. My father was sick. He had lymphoma. So I felt like, and my wife's parents lived uh, in Schenectady near Albany. So we went back there. We had, a, we had a, uh, a girl, baby girl. So that's what drew us back. And we landed in Ithaca. I found a job in Ithaca, which only, that didn't last very long, but at least it got me there in Ithaca. And Ithaca's a wonderful place. And then you came out here to Arizona for the Indian Public Health No, Center. that's actually before. I moved from oh. here, and actually I, I was 79, uh, well, 80 and 81 that I was in the Indian Health Service. I mean, Oh, just 80 to 81? Yeah, yeah. So was, just two years? Yeah, a year and a half I was here. Was it in Tuba City? No, it was in a place called Toye. But in Arizona? Yeah, it was about 100 miles uh, east of Tuba City on the same road. And, and what was your experience from a year and a half on the Navajo Indian Reservation? Well, how much time we got? Because <laughs> Arizona, 25% of the land is Indian Reservation. I know. It was a pretty awesome experience. I'm going to tell you one story that I got from there. I, would, I was a dentist in this uh, area, Toye, which means no water. The, the Indian Health Service built this boarding school and clinic where they didn't realize there was any water there, so they had to end up pumping it. Then they found out why they called it Toye. Anyways, um, there's one... I was a dentist and there were a couple of nurses on this compound, and the closest physician was probably about 30 miles away in Ganado or Kings Canyon. And the, what, the first emergency I got was somebody came to my door and they were pregnant, and they were, they were about to have their baby, and they came to my door for that, so I said, no, you got to go to the hospital. But then um, there's one morning, it was a Saturday morning, and I'm allergic to bees, I wanted to put that out there. So I got a call from this girl on the phone, and she says, my sister's got a bee stuck on her finger. I said, well, take it off. She says, I can't get it off. And I said, where are your parents? Well, they're out with the cows. There's open range there, and the cows just roam around, so they're out. So I said reluctantly, I said, all right, bring her over to my house. And I had a screen door, so I was going to look through it, and she had a bee stuck on her finger. What am I going to do? I told my family, how am I going to handle this? This person, and the nurses weren't around to handle it. Or anything. So she came, and... They came to the door, and I looked down, and there's this like three-year-old, and she, on her little finger there was a B, but there was the letter B. It was the letter B, one of those refrigerator magnets, and it was, she had jammed it on her finger and couldn't get it off, and it blew my mind. And I took her over to the dental clinic and cut the B off. Oh my God, that is <laughs> hilarious. Yeah, my, uh, my youngest is allergic to bees, and he was stung by a bee one time, and his Lips got all oh, yeah. swelled up and everything, and we get EpiPen. The second time he got bit by a bee, it was an ambulance. So then we did that um, allergy deal yeah, where yeah, he yeah. started giving the shots and all that kind of stuff. Well, what the public, I was stationed in a place that was like, as I said, 30 miles from anything, and so 
Um, and I was alone. There weren't any other resources except the telephone to call uh, in Gallup if I had a problem. And like, sometimes, the many times the phones didn't work. So in that, I'm newly out of my uh, dental residency in there. I'm left alone in this place. You have a dentist, a periodontist, who was trained in oral surgery in Romania, come in and place implants. What, what do you think... Um, makes a great implant restoration and design. Well, as far as I saw, she was also trained in, in the United States for perio. Right. So she's double trained. I want to make sure that's proper. Um, what makes a great implant restoration? Well, first of all, it works. It's just like I say, when you know you need a post in a tooth is when the crown falls off and, and you look at the crown and you say, oh shit, I should have put a post in there. That's when you, now, so a lot of times, as long as it works, it's good. But what makes a good one is probably really good planning. Uh, to make sure there's enough bone around the implant. I think the ones that I've seen fail, usually there's not enough circulation. Um, the bone's really thin, and it just can't handle, uh, it's too thin for the circulation to handle it, and the bone recedes. Uh, I think you gotta, also a successful, the person who is placing them has some experience in re restoring them, because if they're not put in the right spot, then our job is to restore them. That can be a real headache. Um, it's really important that the patients have great care uh, before the surgery, and that means making sure they got the proper medications. Doxycycline seems to be the a medication of choice after implants, at least for our surgeon, because that, it's not for antibiotics, but it turns off the osteoclasts, and therefore increases the survival of the implant. Uh, all of our surgeon, she buries all the implants. All of them are, so it takes a second stage. So that has been very successful. Um, and that, but the main thing is the preoperative um, uh, planning and to make sure you have them in the right spot. Yeah, a lot of, a lot of uh, you know, the dentist wants to do everything faster, easier, quicker. And sometimes I can bite you longer. And right now, it seems like the problem, you know, when we got out of school, it was all periodontal surgery, doing right. all this heroic set of teeth. Yeah. Then they got this idea, led by manufacturers, that implants have a 98% success rate. So they started treating all the periodontal disease, furcations, and all that stuff with just titanium and steel. Mm -hmm. But now that I'm out of school 30 years, now we're seeing that 20% of implants have periimplantitis at five years and a third have them at nine years. What, and, and the periodontists themselves don't even have, uh, have they even agreed on a protocol for this. Yeah. What, what do you think um, well, one thing causes that, periimplantitis? Wow, well, that's a good question. Well, one thing is that, um, and I came up with this on my own, although I'm, I'm not the only one that's done this, but uh, it was with it, having cement that's pushed down into the, into the, you know, the sulcus of the implant, and that's supposed to cause it, but nobody really knows why they fail. I think they fail also if you, if how they're put in, if they're not, if there's not enough bone around there, it probably won't work, unless you're lucky. So luck has something to do with them working. Um, but what I found is re the restoring them is that, and I discovered this by one time I, uh, patient of mine had a uh, PFM crown, which I cement, it was one of the first ones I did, and I cemented on with permanent cement over the implant. He came back and the lingual cusp had broken off. So what am I gonna do? Am I gonna cut the whole crown off? So what I, what I did is I made, I, I made a screw hole in it. And I drilled in there carefully until I could find where the screw was, and then I could unscrew it, and it came out like uh, screw retained. And I got something to say about screw retained. So, I got the idea, why not put a screw hole in the crown to begin with? Why wait till after they fail or something, they come, the crowns come loose? This, that why wait until that happens to try to take them off? Why not have it already there? Now, screw-retained implants do have that, and that's the great thing about it, except putting screw-retained implants when you have adjacent teeth, measly and distant to the tooth, is a pain in the ass. You know, if you especially getting contacts right, you put it in, you uh, you know you have to keep taking it in and out to get the contact right, and then you torque it in, and the contacts are too tight. Uh, some people just leave them, and hopefully it, it works. But I didn't do that. I, then I would have to take it out and torque it in. It took me several times in and out. So what I came up with 
is to, um, and I, I try to brainwash my, um, the residents about this, is to do a custom uh, abutment for every case and, and make a screw hole in the crown, a zirconia crown. They'll mill it exactly where that is. And when you cement it, uh, and I use permanent cement, so once you use temporary cement, if you wait long enough, the permanent cement, you can't get them off. And what, what it does is that when you put the cement in there with the screw hole, it, the cement will vent out through that hole and you won't get that pushing, you won't get that force or pressure of pushing the cement into the sulcus. So I think it helps with that. It also, if you ever have to, and then what you do is you clean that off and you put a composite on top of it. And I, uh, I have slides that show the, uh, the residents that I don't care where the screw hole is. I even, in number eight, I did it on a patient and the screw hole came out the buckle. But I believe in this so much that we'll, we'll just blend in the composite to that. And if there's ever a problem, it's really easy to take them off. So just remember, young kids that's still in dental kindergarten, that um, you know, dental manufacturers have a whole history of um, misleading us. Um, you know, when they tell you that their implants have a 98% success rate when all literature says at five years, 20% have periimplantitis, and that cement, that excess cement, how bizarre is that, that the that cement is called dental implant cement with the ADA seal of approval, and if there's any excess that causes periimplantitis, gum disease, and failure, I mean, wouldn't you think one of the protocols for a dental implant success is that if the dentist missed some of the excess cement, it wouldn't cause catastrophic failure? Well, it's also when you, you have margins that go uh, sub gingival enough, you can't clean the cement off anyway. How, how many product burns have you been through? How many, what year did you graduate, you said? 78. 78. What, how many product burns have we, we gone through? Dicor. Yeah. Remember Dicor? They said, this is back in the 80s, if she's a beautiful woman, just do these Dicor crowns. What percent of yours broke? Uh, you know, I didn't do many Dicors. What I did was... Um, but of the ones you did, how many broke? Procera crowns. Yeah, they had Procera. aluminum cores. Or they even had tight, uh, uh, zirconia cores, but the porcelain would fracture. Yeah. So the first thing I did so was... Like Procera, porcelain, porcelain broke off the... Oh, yeah. The tight, tight About three, no, no. You know what would happen glass? is the whole thing would fracture. When they were made with aluminum cores, after three or four years, the whole thing would break. One of the halves would break off. You remember our glass? Yes. Horaeus Kalser, the, mm -hmm. the art came off the glass. Mm -hmm. um, <laughs> our, I, I've declared Targus Vectris. Yeah, well, you can tell the young dentist, we can say, you, you're going to learn a lot from us because we've had a lot of failures. I think the... But I learned mostly from the millennials because when I was young uh -huh. and dumb and aggressive, I believed all the marketing and tried everything. Now, at my age, it's like, I'm going to let you guys all try it. Uh, I, I, I want to see everything you're doing five years later. You know, I mean, I just thought, you, you got all these problems that aren't, all these... Um, things you do that aren't broke, but the younger are always trying the, the next best thing, and I want them to try all the next well, best thing, and then I want to see if it works. That's work. true, but it might be our responsibility, somewhat, especially in this venue, to give advice to the younger dentist that, we, hey, this works, and look, you and know. Don't try anything that's been out for well, five you years. Can, you, no, you can try, yeah, don't try anything out for five years, or somebody's got to do it, but just know if you do it, the risks are high. Right now, zirconia, although it does have its problems, is probably the best material that's come out uh, for crowns. Man, it's like... You know, but the, someone will say, oh, here's a zirconia we can put pores on. It's always a twist or a turn. And uh, again, you know, when you own your own practice like I do, when I just place all these dicors, you know what percent of them end up breaking eventually? Between 5, 10, 20, all of them. And guess how many I had to redo for free under right. warranty? And the lab doesn't even, they don't take any responsibility for it. Oh, yeah, yeah. I mean, you were doing art glass and Targus Vectors. You call your lab man. And yeah. Dude, it all fell apart. Yeah. Oh, you know, you should have done a PFM. <laughs> I got it. Well, are you yes. going to do the PFM for free? No. No. Yeah. No. So be, be, be cautious. You know, because even that, um, even that, um, what was that other one that, uh, that Megagen came out of the deal, that for bone grafting? We'll just take the extracted tooth. Throw it in that thing that looked like the, uh, the in the movie Fargo, uh, the, the the pulp chipper, uh -huh. and and you just have all this nice graftable stuff. Well, I don't know if any grafts that are part enamel, cementum, dentin, microorganisms, fungi, viruses, 
Um, I, I don't know if that's a good mm -hmm. idea. I, yeah. I really want it to be a good idea. Well, but I'll let someone else. What you can do it. is you can. Uh, what I usually tell the residents and tell myself if if this was your sister or brother or mother or father or child, would you put that in them? And if you say yes, then that's a really good test. No, no matter. That's confusing because if it was your sister, you'd kill her, kill the patient. <laughs> it's your brother, you'd do it for free. No, I'm just kidding. Yeah. Um, you, I, um, you have two children. I do. Actually, actually, I have four. Oh, I have four children. Because my wife has two. We got together. One is in Colorado, and the, my two children are in Ithaca. I'm very blessed for that. And then we have a, a daughter that's in Colorado, Telluride, beautiful place. Oh, yeah. And then we have one uh, in Washington, D.C. But actually, you have five children because you wrote a book. And uh, I've written a book, and I always say writing a book is like having a child. I mean, it takes you nine months. You wrote Journey to Midri? Mudre. Mudre. Uh-huh. What, what was going on in your journey to write a book, Journey to Mudre? And I guarantee you it took nine months to write that book. Well, maybe more like 25 years. Yeah, so that's why so that's why I say writing a book is like having a baby. I mean, it's a huge commitment. Yeah, and I call you don't write a book on a weekend. Right, and I called it a journey because when I started writing, I started writing. What I ended up with is something totally different. Um, so, when I was in dental school, again, I, you're talking to somebody who's not was never really enamored with dentistry. I was more about service to people. So that's where I come from. I don't, I'm not this person that says, wow, look at this great stuff. It's not great to be a dentist. It's more about how can I serve the people best and excellent. Uh, and in dental school in the 70s, I was 74 I started, uh, I was a little more barbaric than it is now. You know, the anesthetics weren't as good and the instruments weren't as good. So it was more barbaric. So I started there has to be another way maybe to do this. So I started looking at alternative ways of doing things. And um, it started with homeopathy and dietary things. I mean, we'd, uh, you're reading about sugar and refined foods. And I, I gave them up myself because I was telling my patients to do that. So I started bringing those in. And I thought that that was the secret to being, having the patients be healthy. And I kept taking that in, and my book explains the journey. I kept taking on new things, acupuncture, homeopathy, herbal su supplements, uh, and, and nutritional supplements, and looking at a lot of hands-on healing, and really exploring what was going on in alternative medicine. I was trained as a scientist through um, my undergraduate at the University of Buffalo, and in dental school, science was really important. So I felt myself as a scientist, and I had this curiosity of, what was going on here in alternative medicine. And through my journey, um, I found that the wisdom about the healer, the relationship between the healer lies within the patient and not the healer. And it, it, it's a, uh, the healer can develop a listening for this. And it's not something that comes out of their mouth. It's more of a something that's I'm unconscious, but we can become conscious of it. So in my journey, I discovered that the, the, the patient has the wisdom to guide us in their healing. And we just have to do what we do, but we do it with their guidance. Uh, I needed a word that said a uh, person who is sick and has wisdom, and there's nothing in the English language that has that. So I asked a Russian friend of mine who's an acupuncturist that I work with, uh, Vladimir Bobkov, I said, is there a Russian word that says, oh, a person who is sick and has wisdom? And he said, mudre. Uh, although I think mudre means wisdom in Russian, it was so poetic, I just made it mean that. So the book is not about healing techniques, but it's how to develop a listening for our, our patients, and as a patient, how we can generate a listening in the people who are treating us. That's interesting. You know, 30 years, chair side, um, I, I, I've read many things how when people are going under, you know, severe cancer, stage 4 cancer, how their psychology and their deposition has so much to do with the outcomes. I mean, I have told um, people that were 75 years old men, you have oral cancer. I mean, they, they have like a big lump in their throat and they just like, they just like, uh, why? and I'd say, well, 
you need to get this biopsy. I mean, I'd show it with an internal camera. They go, I, I don't even care, dude. And I'm sitting there thinking, wow. Mm -hmm. And it was amazing how some people are told they have cancer and they're just optimistic. I'm going to beat this. And they clean up their diet and their exercise. They start eating lean and, and they're all positive. And there's just a lot of people who say they, those people just have a much better success. Mm -hmm. I mean, it, it is mind over body. And there is just so much things that we don't know. Yeah, and that's part of it. The part, the book is mainly about the relationship that we have with our patients, whether we're um, acupuncturists or we're dentists or physicians. It, there is a communication that happens. Uh, and this is coming from a science, I try to keep it as scientific as possible. I use Jungian psychology uh, and, and meditation and even med some meditation, things in meditation are scientifically proven to show that it creates uh, a calmness within us and opens us up to a, a different realm of, of being. Now, is that book on Amazon or on your Yes, website? it's on Amazon. You can also get, get it on a JTM Now. Well, JTM Now is my website for the book, is Journey to Mudre. Uh, but that'll guide them to uh, Amazon. Well, all your reviews are five star. You don't have any reviews that are not five star. That's, that's pretty damn impressive. Um, I am. Um, whenever uh, I heard some that Dennis the other day tell him that um, he got a one star from a patient and he uh, called her up and he said, well, why did you give me a one star? She was well, that, isn't that the best? So she, she didn't know that one star. Oh, was right. First. That's awesome. That's but, uh, and oh, it, it sounds like one star would be the best when you're a homo sapien living in our solar system <laughs> with one star. I mean, when, I mean, would you want to live in a solar system with five stars in it? Uh, so it seems... Uh, Kind of uh, not intuitive. So if there was a young dentist list to you, which you know they are, a quarter of them are in dental school, the rest are under 30, how do they uh, learn more about alternative medicine, um, your, you know, what, what, what you teach in, in a science base? Well, the first thing to do is explore it on Google, you know, online. At least get a taste of it. You have to have a passion for it, which I, I do and I did. Uh, part of my passion was to help people, and you have to have a passion for this. Is it necessary to run a practice this way? No. There are many successful practices, and you don't need to do this. I would, my passion guided me this way. Um, so one, one thing to do is to uh, go online and remember online, I don't know how much you're really going to get that's truth and science, because that's not what it is. What it is is to try to you know get the information out, and who knows if it's true or not. But that at least gets you started in the language. There's a whole language that accompanies this. It's a specialty, just like um, den uh, any specialty in dentistry. And once you learn that, there are things written um, in uh, dental journals sometimes, and there are people that give courses on nutrition at the. When I go to the Hinman meeting, that's the one I go to every year in Atlanta, and there's usually people talking about nutrition there. And you can get some basic things there. But you know, um, nutrition, um, to me, it's kind of like uh, politics or kind of like um, holistic medicine. I mean, yes. well, when, when you look at nutrition, I mean, come on, I'm 55. How, how many diet fads have we lived through? Well, I think what you gotta do is try it on yourself and your family. Yeah. You, you want to kill your sister? No, I give her some stuff or something. But I would first. I started uh, with homeopathy and all the supplements. I started on my family, and my children were really young, and I saw that they re they did great react. They had great reactions to natural remedies. Instead of giving them medication, I'd say, oh, they were an, um, access for my experimentation. I used my own family, and homeopathy works great on children. It's just a great thing because they're, they don't... So, but, but dentists are concerned much. I know dentists. I mean, I, I've lectured a thousand times live to dentists. Uh -huh. Sure. Um, they tend to be conservative. They're more likely to be Republican. Yeah. A hillbilly, redneck. I mean, they're, they're, they're conservative. And um, I know dentists have come up to me saying, uh, that's so cool that you... Uh, Talk about your brother and show that that you know that he's gay. Um, I'm in a small town in Texas. Um, my biggest fear in life is that the other dentists will find out I'm homosexual. I'd probably it'd just be horrible. I've heard other dentists say, "Well, I had to withdraw from the local dental society because I'm a holistic dentist." And you know, they just quite. Have you got any feedback? Well, first of all, back? the word holistic is. I don't think it's empowering. 
because it, in itself it separates there's traditional and a holistic and there's this thing that there's a tension between the two and that's why I think integrative is much better and that means you bring but does the market there. know what integrative means I mean they all know what holistic means I mean, they may not know what homers in New York when yeah. they see integrative do they think well you know for me it doesn't really matter again we're going to go back to the word passion that for me, it's passionate for me. And when I'm passionate about something, it's going to spill over to my patients. Uh, and I don't advertise at all. It's all by word of mouth. And so I just introduce this into my practice, not to quite make money, although that helps. Um, it's, I don't sell the supplements much. It's more about a service to the patient. When you give great service to the patient, and it comes in the form of giving homeopathic remedies or a nutritional supplement, or giving medication, you know, giving doxycycline for people with periodontal disease or having an implant, it's all in the realm of service. And if you can keep it that way, then, it, then there's not so much polarization there. I really would recommend, if, you're, if you have the passion for this, looking at to integrate it into your practice rather than making your practice separate from other people. Because the separateness, we all want to be special, and so we attract patients. But what's going to attract patients is word of mouth. Advertisement's okay, it's expensive, but word of mouth is the best thing. So, it, um, you know, I had three things I want to talk about. One was my practice, and hopefully you got a handle on some of the things that go on in my practice. And then what happens at um, a teaching at a universe, um, a place where you get well, residency, and I'd highly recommend that for a couple reasons. One, I think dentistry, I know dentistry is a branch of medicine, but we're not trained that way. But you go and practice in a hospital setting, or even our practices, people come in with all lists of medications, and we're supposed to know about it. If not, you know, we're not barbers anymore. So one thing that teaching gives you an access about integrating medicine and dentistry, and it's, I think it's really important. Other countries do it. They start out in medical school and right. then become dentists. Well, the Soviets do it. Yeah, the Soviets do it. The Chinese do it. I, I spent a, a week in China speaking at a dental hospital there. And, and how, how does China do it? They do it. They go, to, they go to medical school first. That's another whole story that I don't, I don't know how much time we have left, but I could spend another hour talking about my trip to China. Well, let's hear it. You got time? I, I'm, I'm here. Well, China is, uh, they go to medical school first, and they go for two years, and then they, uh, they branch off into a specialty of dentistry. So they have very little clinical experience in general dentistry. In fact, there's very little general dentistry in China. There's, uh, there's no insurance. There's no Social Security. Everybody has to pay for their treatments. And when they pay for their treatments, they want that the best. So the culture generates this. Uh, so the dentists in China, at least that I've experienced and what they told me, they're all specialists. Very few general dentists. In Eastman Dental Center, we have some of the, the uh, uh, dentists from China come and train with us for a year or two to learn about comprehensive dentistry. But that's not what the public does. The public wants, if they have, um, <clears throat> if they have an extraction, they go see an oral surgeon. If they have endo, they go see an endodontist and like that, and there may not be this care. The endodontist might restore the tooth there. In China, and all, oh yeah, it was, it was about uh, hospital, I mean, excuse me, becoming MDs first. So what you learn is uh, the dental assistants are, have to be nurses. They, don't, they have to be nurses in China. So it is more of a, of a medical experience when you go there. They, only, they have dental hospitals, they don't have uh, private practices. We did a podcast with the uh, downtown capital of Cambodia, with the largest dental hospital. So I want to uh, finish up what I was saying about teaching. I really recommend people who are coming out of school go back to teach. You, teaching is a way you learn the best. What you do is you get to see all the mistakes that are made by other people are doing, <laughs> and you can learn a whole bunch. Also, they come and ask you advice for things that you're supposed to know about, and if you don't know about it, it kind of encourage you, inspires you to learn about that so you can improve your own practice. It also will enhance your practice when people find out that you teach at a university or a hospital. Um, there's just this confidence they have in you that you, you must know a lot more because you teach there. And I think you do. But we're talking about how nutrition is like politics where 
you know, math is just pure science. There's hardly anything in math and geometry and trig that people argue about. Okay. But when you go into like politics, like on, you know, growing the economy, I mean, the PhD economists say one thing, the business people, but there's, you know, there's, politics is, you know, it's half voodoo, half science. Um, nutrition, um, you know, every time I talk to someone who has a PhD in nutrition, they tell me, you know, when they're hearing so much of the nutrition advice, they, they, they just cringe. I mean, um, so, um, but do you get any pushback from your colleagues? I mean, has it made you uncomfortable? No, no. Is that acupuncture or integrative medicine? When I first started, I thought so, but now it's acupuncture so common it isn't. But I used to teach acupuncture, and I, did, and I didn't fear it. I don't fear it because I, I come from a place of service rather than trying to sell something. But do you do acupuncture in your office? Yeah. Like how often? I do it daily. Patients choose that instead of uh, local anesthetic. So you use acupuncture to do what type of procedures? Well, I've done, uh, mostly it's restorative. Films. Okay. Yeah, I mean, I've had, I have taken out teeth with only acupuncture, but you have to pick your patients really carefully. You, the, when you hear about these people getting surgery, which it can be done, but you have to pick your, the patient has to have some kind of, a lot of tolerance already. Well, who was the, who was the hypnotist we did in Ireland? Dr. Mike Gow. Hey, uh, Dr. Mike Gow, what did he do on that lady, was it? He did um, an entire implant on a yeah. front incisor using nothing but hypnosis. Yeah, yeah. you have, I mean, you have and, to and, it, and it was filmed and put on TV. It yeah. was a television documentary. Yeah, exactly. I mean, the mind is an amazing it is. thing if you need to be hypnotized but, for a root canal in the crown. That's true, but you, there are people that you can treat without getting them numb. I mean, you must believe it. Some they people, I remember, some people come in and just take my tooth out. You know, and you say, no, I can't do that, but some people don't need it. And the nervous system varies from all across the country. When I worked in the southern, I worked in southern Pennsylvania where the Mennonites, and they hardly took any anesthetic. Maybe for extraction, but hardly any anesthetic. And I went to Navajo Indian Reservation, they all took anesthetic. And now in Ithaca, it's maybe 25% of the people take, do dentistry without anesthesia. They just choose not to do it. But some of it is the equipment and use electric hand pieces and things like that. It really helps in, um, in uh, decreasing the vibration of that. So I want to go back to talking about teaching as a possibility. So the teaching, um, again, it gives you, it's the best way to learn. It helps you integrate medicine into your practice in a way that makes sense. Um, so that, that's really helpful. And it also is a way to give back. I think wherever we are in our careers, giving back is really important. It's like exhaling. If you only breathe and hold it and bring it in, it's not going to work. We need to give back. So, Howard, it's our responsibility to give back to these people that are coming in. And you do a great job in the, in the service that you give to people in this service. But I think all of us can do that. Uh, another thing I, I, uh, I like to talk about is that it's a third part. One was my practice, the other part was teaching. And the third thing is, um, how is the community? The community that you live in is a great way to give back, and also it will give back to you. So, new dentist, you need to go out and join a church, a temple, or something that's going to give you access to people and talking. And when you talk to people, they'll say, oh, you're a dentist. Oh, that's pretty cool. So I'm involved in a lot of things. I'm involved in a temple, a meditation center. Um, a I, temple? A temple, a synagogue. Oh, okay, so I'm a temple. Yeah, yeah, I'm Jewish. Okay, so, so it's, uh, you're in a temple and a what? And a, a meditation, meditation center. I, I'm a treasurer of the, a meditation center called the Foundation of Light in Ithaca. Foundation of Light? Yeah, and that's, a, <laughs> again, another whole story. Uh, although that, that place is mentioned in my book several times. And then I, I play in bands. And what instrument do you play? I play guitar, bass, and trumpet. And what's your music genre? Uh, we, I do classic rock mostly. And then we also, I also play in a big band, we do jazz. My wife sings in both bands. And what's your uh, favorite band? I'm pretty eclectic. I like all bands. I like the Grateful Dead, I was telling your son. Yeah. yeah I can get into that, I can get into the Beatles. And then a Maroon 5, I, you know, and I know I'm leaving a whole bunch out. It's not coming out. I just saw now. a study um, yesterday 
that was out. I think it was in the New York Times where I, um, they used all the data from Spotify. Uh -huh. So, you know, that one of the neat things about these internet apps is you have a large data pool. Like when that mathematician got a hold of um, Match.com's data. Yeah. I mean, she found that the number one variable for hooking up with another person was distance. And number two, believe it or not, was out of, um, you had to have a photo. They did no do mine. But the uglier the person was, the higher the chance they get hit on. Because if you look like Wonder Woman, <laughs> all the men would say, well, I'm not going to get Wonder Woman. But when they see some short, fat, bold chick wearing boots, they think, <laughs> well, I got, I got a shot with her. So they were. So the research showed, like, if you know, whatever your flaw is, like, if, if you're overweight, show a, a full body. Don't show uh -huh. the face thing. Okay. Um, but on the Spotify deal, another mathematician, because when they're doing their thesis, they want to get a big data set and try to find order. Mm -hmm. And she found out. Did you read that paper, Ryan? What's that? Did you read that paper, that music paper? No. That um, your greatest songs for a girl um, came out about thirteen. And for a boy came out about 16. So, so whatever biological change that girl's going through in men arc or whatever, 13 and boys at 16. I remember I remember my boys, a lot of them, um, about, about 16 is when you started wanting to see Britney Spears instead of going hunting. Uh, you, know, I, you know, I had four boys and all, one by one. I'll never forget the first time it ever happened that they knew there was a girl. We were walking in 7-Eleven and there was this big Coke display. It had a big cardboard cut out of Britney Spears, you know, pointing to the Coke, and Eric elbows me and goes, <laughs> and I thought, oh my God, he just realized there's girls on this planet. Yeah, you but, but so when you're coming, when you're coming to, when you're coming from playing in the backyard sandbox to realizing there's boys, girls, but, but yeah, they mostly die. So Beatles, how old were you when the Beatles came out? Uh, I was probably in fifth grade. I was probably nine. Yeah, and uh, you know, Grateful Dead. Yeah, but you know, I like we only had one top forty song. Yeah, they they came out with the album every year their whole life, and it was a touch of gray. Yeah, touch of gray, right? That's an awesome. Yeah, song. It was only one song yeah. ever made it. Um, but getting back to the point, uh, uh, that's a great thing about music. But the main thing is to get involved in your community. Yeah. And it's a way to give back, and the more you get involved in your community, you'll be able to talk to people. It's going to work much better than advertising. It is a way of advertising, but it's going to work much better because they get to see you and know you. Yeah. Um, and so whatever you, you do, at least get involved in some kind of organization where there's folks around and you communicate with them. Like a gym is good, but unless you communicate with the people and you're just there working out, it's got to be some place where you speak to yeah. each other. You've got to talk. You know, I always, I always call it get out and running for mayor. You know, get out and running for mayor. You know, when, when I opened up my dental office, you know what I did? What? Saturday and Sundays, I walked down. I got a map of all of Altivy, every street. I colored them off with a magic, with a magic marker. Walked down every single street, knocked on every single door, and I rang the door and all, hey, I'm Howard Fran, you know, the Safeway Plaza up there for 8th and Elliott. That dental officer, that's me. I'm 25. I'm going to practice till I'm 65. I just thought I'd get out and meet the neighborhood, and I had a backpack, and I had gloves, mirrors, flashlight. One in every three houses made an appointment. Wow, that's awesome. And, and now, you know, my latest um, deal for the community What's is, because I think it's so big. So, you know, I have Dentaltown. Uh -huh. So I took Dentaltown, and I've had uh, Ken, I hired Ken Scott in 98, and he still runs the show. He's uh, got um, five programmers on his team. So five programmers have been working on Dental Town from 1998 to 2018, 20 years. It's a half million lines of code. I cut and pasted Dental Town. I live in Ahwatukee to Tukey Town. Mm. And now, um, and I can cut and paste it for your town too. So now um, it, it's pretty cool because, um, you know, Ahwatukee has problems with schools and freeways. And we have a uh, golf course that went bankrupt and now it's all weeds and and uh, there's a lot of issues with teachers, and and so instead of just podcasting dentist for Dental Town, now I've um, where is um, Tukey Town news downloads manage? Where are my podcasts right here? So now I've um, podcasted um, thirty. So I have done an hour podcast right here where you're sitting in my dining room with um, every. Um, leader of every church, every, um, you know, just, just 45 different businesses, and it's really um, helping the community come together.
That's awesome. And I, I think, um, you know, I, I think um, getting community involvement is, yeah. is, 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 is everything. Yeah, and you have the passion for this. You and your son, I can see, work well together in this. Well, he's realm. dead inside. He's, uh, <laughs> he's my son, and he came out of college, and he said, Dad, your, podco your podcast show sucks. Let me help you. Uh, yeah, that's awesome. And, uh, and after two years, he uh, has no will to live. He's dead inside and uh, always uh, crushes up glass and puts it in his food. Yeah. But uh, that, that's his nutrition. So there, there's one more thing, at least, what I like to talk about is money. Because it underlies everything. I mean, I've heard one time there's three things in life that we have conflicts with. One is sex, and the other is money, and the other is God. So, money, sex, and God. Yeah, those three things that's usually. And uh, money, we know what that is. Sex, we know what that is, and God, in my realm, is everything else. It's how we live our lives. But we're going to talk about, let's talk a little bit about money. Because we're talking about for younger dentists who listen to this, and that really is, uh, especially when you start, that kind of rules the roost. You can pray, but you still got to be able to manage money. Um, so uh, I think what it is is that having, uh, we're not trained very well in dental school about business. And we're supposed to go out, and we're talking about starting your own business. I remember when I first got in practice, I didn't even know I had to pay state income tax until it was too late. And then I said, what? Nobody told me to do that. Um, so there's a, it's really important to spend some time studying about money and how to manage it. And I'm not talking about just growing your wealth, but how to make it work in your, in your, um, in your practice. One thing that I've found, and for many years that I've done this, is give a bonus to my staff. And how this works, I, don't, I haven't heard anybody else do this, but what it works for me is that I, I pick out an attainable amount that we collect, not produce, attainable amount. So let's say now in my practice it's $112,000. If they reach that $112,000, they get 1% of that to split. And it's not every one, and it depends how many, how it's split is how many hours you've put in that for that um, cycle, that month. Uh, and if you go on vacation, it doesn't count. So other people benefit more. So then anything after that threshold, that they, get a, uh, they get, still get 1%. So if we do $120,000, they get $1,200 to split. And that has been something that, that each of my employees, and we spread it out, makes uh, up to $2,000 more a year out of that. So it's this underlying motivation that you can give your staff. Pick an amount that will work. You don't want to pick something that is not attainable, because then it doesn't really matter. But pick an amount that will work, and you'll see that it will motivate the people around you to work harder to attain that. And then if you, you make it that it works, it may not be able to work in the beginning, but once, the, once you get some cash flow in, it really helps doing that. Well, we went over uh, our brands an hour. Uh, we're 11 minutes over, so I'll just end on one little rant on bonuses. Um, what I truly believe on bonuses is that um, the more money you make, the more bonuses motivate. So someone who's making uh, $10 an hour at a job, well, if they were really motivated by money, they wouldn't be working a job for $10. But someone making $100,000 a year, man, they're completely driven by money, and they'll jump through hoops for 10000 But back to the wages of a dental assistant um, that you're working closely with. One of the things, we, we have bonus systems and all that stuff, but one of the things I've always done is that if I ask her to work through lunch so I can do a thousand dollar root canal, damn it, they love cash. I mean, if you just missed your lunch, I'm gonna go back to my wallet, I'm gonna get some cash, I'm gonna go put it in her pocket, and mm -hmm. they, they love it. And, you know, they got things to do after work. Um, you know, the assistants have children, they wanna get out of there. Um, the ones that 27% of baby boomers had no kids, they think it'll be a third of millennials. So usually my baby, my, if they have children, they'll, they'll skip lunch, but if they uh, don't have children, they'll go long. But you know, when you stay an hour, two hours after work to do a root canal build up and Syrac CAD CAM crown, and you know, you close at five, and they stay there two hours late, and I got to bill out, you know, what is that, you know, 2,000 bucks? Damn, go stick a Benjamin in her hand, you know, just right then and there. Because my, my, my team, uh, they, you, you stick a Benjamin in their hand after two hours late, and plus they're getting paid two hours. Uh, they light up. That, that's how restaurants do it. You know, they, they don't tip out the bartenders and the busboys and the waitresses at the, at, at, on the 1st and the 15th. 
they do it that night. I mean, you bust an ass all night, you're getting out late, and they split the tips, and everybody goes home happy. That's great. Yeah, and that's just one part of it. For, for I'm thinking about the, the dentists that are just coming out or in practice, probably talking about bonuses is, is a hard thing to give out money when you have you know, a half a million dollars of debt underneath you or more. So connect with other dentists. Uh, use us. We're, um, I'm going to put out that we're willing to give you our services and our advice to help you uh, be good. Uh, be good, great practitioners and successful in your, um, in your business. And I'm going to challenge us, all, all of us older dentists that I'm 65 and a half and I've still got the passion and this is what drives me is to serve. And I'm going to invite other dentists to come and help the younger dentists coming out. Give them advice. Send them patience. And on that note, thank you so much for coming by the house today. Sure. Uh, thank you. Uh, tell your son. Uh, Ruben, Ruben. Uh, thanks for referring dad and uh, I noticed your website was made by Dark Horse Technology. Yes. <laughs> and um, Ruben's uh, podcast was, um, there it is, 773, great son. And then we talked about uh, um, sleep medicine, that was in episode 286 with uh, Dental Sleep Solutions with Guy Yatros and Richard Drake. And then um, um, we talked about dental hospital in Cambodia, that was Room Chang. Uh, episode 650, Room Chang Dental Hospital uh, with Tithong Yo in downtown uh, Cambodia, was it? Yeah. And, um, and then uh, Dental Hypnosis with Mike Gao. Um, one last final thought on that. The one thing Mike Gao blew my mind away is that when someone has anxiety and you just put them to sleep, you, you didn't treat their anxiety. You just masked it. Mm -hmm. You just knocked them out. And he, he never liked that. He wanted to deal with her anxiety, and by discussion and talking and hypnosis, um, he thought it was a lot better on the journey because now he he treated their anxiety. Mm -hmm. And whereas Americans just like, oh, you got a problem? Here, let me put a a blanket over it and knock you out with profanol. Mm -hmm. And Mike's like, no, let's let's do hypnosis. Mm -hmm. But uh, on that note, thank you so much for coming over.